So I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Greg Belisle, and I'm um, the representative for Zone 7, which is um, one of seven zones for the Portland School Board. Um, most of you know probably that we live in a zone. Uh, you have to live in a zone to be elected, but we're elected citywide or district-wide. Um, so even though somebody's from one zone, the reminder is that we serve all <coughs> students, not just students from your cluster. Um, so with that, I'm going to have, um, we are lucky enough to have five of us here, so I thank my four colleagues for coming to join me. Um, this is the most I've seen um, at one of these town halls, so um, it's an advantage hopefully to you all. Um, but before I have them introduce themselves, I want to talk a little bit about some of the ground rules that we've been using that help us facilitate this. Um, one is that raise your hand when you have a question, and we're here to hear your questions or your thoughts, your comments. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, we'll call on you, and then what we'll do is after we answer that question, and with five of us, you might get five different answers or five similar answers. Sometimes with elected officials, um, many of us want to add our own flavor to, to what we would want to say. Um, but I would ask us colleagues to keep it, if somebody said something similar so that we can get to more, more of our guests' um, questions, that would be great. Um, but after you've asked your question, we're going to try to move on to another person. Um, and we won't circle back to you again until everybody that's wanted to ask at least one question has had that opportunity. Now, the ones that I've gotten to participate in, it doesn't quite work that smoothly because somebody will ask a question and um, there's a really easy follow-up or a quick follow-up that will help. So bear with me. We'll try to do the best we can with that. Um, but again, we will just move from, after you've answered your question, we will skip you if you have another question until we get to other folks in the room. So please try to do that. Otto, you have uh, something? We have uh, a translator here, and I'll let you go ahead and answer. Hi, good evening. My name is Andres. I'm an independent contractor with PPS, certified Spanish interpreter. You want to hear this in Spanish? Please raise your hand. Thank you. That's great. Um, I also want to mention that um, there might be some thoughts or ideas that um, contradict or contrast or don't coincide with your own personal belief. We ask that, of course, that we're all respectful of the individual opinions that are shared. Um, and I am confident that that will happen, but it's just a good reminder sometimes um, because as we're talking about our children, um, passions can run pretty deep um, and pretty... Um, pretty close to home. And so just remind, just remember to be respectful of each other as, as we have these discussions. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank, um, before we introduce ourselves, um, thank Mr. Cook, first of all, for hosting us. Thanks for coming. And I, and I won't have much of a chance to do this in public, but I want to thank him for all his service over the years. I know you get to retire this year. Yeah. Um, and I know that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not counting the days, though. Oh. Um, <laughs> love this place. And if you're a parent in the Cleveland area, you're going to love this place. Come to Cleveland. You're going to love it. We have been very lucky to have him and his leadership, and I know that he will be sorely missed. So thank you, uh, Paul. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, uh, Oregon PTA, for, for co-hosting this with us. We really appreciate that. With that, I've already introduced myself. I'll um, have my colleagues introduce themselves. My name's Steve Buell. I'm from North Portland, actually. That's where I kind of represent. You really don't represent anybody, but that's where it is. Tom Curler. Uh, we have uh, had three kids go through here. Our last one is, is a junior. Uh, and I live up in the Franklin neighborhood. And I'm Bobby Reagan. I had two sons graduate from Portland Public Schools um, from the Lincoln Cluster area. Um, 12th year on the school board. Hi everybody, Ruth Adkins, Zone 1 board member, so uh, Southwest Portland um, since 2007. And um, I have also had three kids go through PPS My Agnes is a junior at Wilson. And I did forget to mention that I have two daughters, um, one at currently at Dunaway and the other at Selwood. Um, and so they are on track to be here um, in a couple of years. So with that, we'll just open it up to the floor. Um, and I should mention that um, staff are in back taking notes. And so these notes will be posted um, after this. And if we don't have an immediate answer to your question, um, we will um, ask staff to help us out to get the answer. And then it'll be posted in that, um, in that question and answer piece. 
Um, and I also want to acknowledge that um, Superintendent Carol Smith is in the back of the room. So she's been also joining us and been, been able to listen to these conversations. So thank you, Superintendent Smith, for joining us. And there's lots of seats right in front. We don't bite. Yep, lots of front seats up front. Who wants to start us off? Nice. We can go home early. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being um, brave to go first. I, I'm a newbie to this area. I'm a longtime educator from Central Oregon. I have three sons who graduated from Redmond High, taught at an outstanding school called Terrebonne, and I now teach at a, a small Christian school in Oregon City. So I read in Ed Week about, I know that the finances are an area of difficulty, but I read in Ed Week that your superintendent, our superintendent now that I live here, received a considerable raise. And I also knew that the Portland teachers had to almost go on strike because of wanting a raise. And it seemed to me a conflict somewhat. So I, I would really like an explanation because I know times are hard, money's hard, and I, of course, support school and have son who lives here, and we vote for the yes, and we'll support. But I, I felt that there was a conflict there in giving out a large raise and a small <coughs> raise to teachers. So maybe you could address that. Sure. I'm, I'm happy to jump in, um, but I also want to allow my colleagues the opportunity. So I'll just start with um, Superintendent Smith has been our superintendent um, now for nine years. Um, and she, since the time she's been here, had received one increase, which was the year prior, sorry, seven years. And she has received one increase, which was a cost of living 2% increase the year prior. Um, if you've been in education in Oregon, you understand, as you pointed out, that funding is difficulty. Um, and over the past seven years, we have continued with our other representative groups to give cost of living 2%, 3%, 4% over that time. The superintendent has not felt as actually rejected, not allowed us to give her a raise during that time because she's known the challenges that have happened um, during, during that time. Um, at this point, we realize that this was probably the best fiscal year that we've had in a while. And our philosophy as a board going into negotiations, even with our teachers, who it was a struggle to get to, um, get to a yes, was we don't want to be the bottom for anybody or anything. We want our staff to feel, to know that they are our greatest assets and to feel respected. Again, teachers came away from our last negotiation not feeling that, but they did receive a regular increase. So if you looked over the same time period from the time the superintendent became superintendent till now, and you take the average percent cost of living increase, she would have wound up where she's at right now. But that was real seven years of lost wages for her. Um, and this was the one year when we thought it was okay. So that's... Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it because it did not look, it did not look very good in Ed Week. Totally it, looked, it, it looked really terrible and I thought, I need to know, I need yeah. to understand the bottom of it because I vote here now. Yes. I, another thought too, I mean for me, um, you know, as around the, the country, the churn of uh, big city in particular superintendents is a huge issue. The chaos and uncertainty that creates when the new superintendent comes in every one, two or three years. So one of the factors for me in addition to everything Greg mentioned was the value that it brings to our district and our community to have a strong, the longevity of a strong leader and that continuity. And so that was another piece. Well thank you. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. I told and you I'll, just, I'll just add one more thing. That's great predictive. We all want to. Uh, my bottom line is that I wanted to be sure that our superintendent was being paid pretty much the average of what other superintendents of uh, districts this size, urban districts this size, and with the amount of longevity that she had. And so um, with all of our employee groups, we do comparisons um, either to local or to national. Um, in this case, locally, there is not another urban district, and so we looked at urban districts around the country with approximately 50,000 students, and we looked at uh, superintendents who had five years or more of experience, and her salary where we landed was e exactly at that medium. So it was hard. A lot of people said to us, well, you should have done, you know, 5% and then 5% and then 5%, and I'm not sure it matters. I mean, what we wanted to do was to make sure she was paid competitively. If we had to replace her tomorrow, we probably be paying the salary if you look at any of the national averages or the comparators. See? 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I voted against the raise. I thought it was pretty outlandish and too much. That doesn't reflect on what I think of the superintendent, who I think is a very wonderful woman, but at the same time, 28% out there was kind of silly and it, right after we'd given the teachers 2.3%, uh, and so I thought it was a big mistake that we made. Of course, uh, if she was doing everything that I wanted, maybe I'd have given her the 28% raise. Never can tell. I'll just finish because you know you, you you don't it school board's great it's just it's local democracy in action and you get to to explain all your votes all the time to everybody uh, I I voted against it because I thought it was uh, I thought we should have given the superintendent a raise but the raise that we gave her was out of was out of market to Oregon um, and it wasn't uh, necessarily appropriate to be um, going after these other big cities uh, when when we have uh, new superintendent contracts just negotiated in Beaverton as an example um, I thought we sh should be proportionately above that and it was just it was just too much so uh, that's why I voted against it. <clears throat> next question yeah. I'll bring something a little closer to home. So my kids go to Abernathy, then now Hosford, and soon Cleveland. And they were blissfully ignorant with uh, Tammy Barron at Abernathy's principal. But then since she left, there's been this cascade of new principals at Abernathy, Hosford, now a new principal at Hosford, now soon a new principal at Cleveland. And attempting to participate in the, the search process, uh, one begins to realize that if there's a, a principal out there in the district, in PPS, somewhere that wants that job, they get to have it really without an interview with the community necessarily. And then it becomes a domino effect of shuffling principles. And so up late it's been sort of a concern of the turnover in principles and how it sort of affects what the principal has done at that school in terms of what they're they brought to the school and then their maybe spontaneous departure like we've had at hospital recently. I wonder if you could comment on some of those. Somebody else go first. Paul just gave us a microphone, which is great. So maybe, uh, just so I don't know if we need to restate, are people able to hear the question that was concerned about principal churn and turnover, particularly in this area recently? So um, thanks for the question, and it's always a concern that we hear consistently. I mean, every year there's a certain amount of turnover, and we definitely hear that. Of course, the personnel matters are handled by the superintendent, and as you know, they're often, um, it's a confidential Human resources issues are usually there can be confidential issues, so there often are things that we can't comment on and that we're, and that we're not directly involved in because it's not our role as board members versus the superintendent. So having said that, I mean I think we definitely um, we definitely hear over and over the importance of each community to really have their voices heard. I enjoyed reading the notes from the meeting I think you had the other night where satellite parents and teachers and students were talking pretty passionately about. I mean Paul's shoes obviously are super hard to fill. Um, but we do it, and I've been really proud to see um, Carol's work, um, particularly in our high school principals have such outstanding leaders in place. So will I totally hear the anxiety and the concern about who will that new leader be, and is it just going to be somebody placed on us that won't fit our needs and won't meet our community? That's the last thing Carol wants, the last thing that any of us wants. We want a good fit, obviously, for sure. Um, so um, I think what I'm hearing is there was the meeting, there's going to be an online survey, and there, as I understand it, there's a new district-wide group that includes someone from the community um, in Cleveland, but is really meant to be a district-wide um, hiring committee to give advice. But I don't know if I just want to weigh in. So I, I hear that concern. Um, principal leadership is really important, and I think one of my takeaways from your question was Paul you're not allowed to retire. <laughs> There's been too much in this area, so you have to stick around. There. Um, but to your to your point, um, I have not experienced um, a process where the explicit intent has been we have an opening and any principal in PPS gets it without community process. That's not a stated policy. That's not that sometimes happens. For example, a quick change that just happened at Hosford. I don't know the details of it. It's probably a personnel conflict issue or confidential issue, excuse me. Um, but there are times, if you've been a manager or a hiring, you know that there are some times when personnel have to be moved for one reason or another. 
Um, sometimes it's for protection of the employee. Sometimes it's for protection of somebody else. Who knows? Um, so there are times, and our policy is explicit, that um, we, we do not intend to ever hamstring staff in making sure we have the best leader in each building. So in emergency situations, quick changes can, like, can, can happen. That being said, as, as Ruth just pointed out, there's a policy that says we want community input. Again, you know your school and your community. I'm going to give you two little stories. The, the policy says that and a new process with the, F, with the administrative directive, which is how, it, how that policy gets put into place, is there are six community members that are part of that. Now, that doesn't mean six parents. I mean, six community members, so it's a pretty broader group because we have many folks to, to engage with that. And one of them will be a parent from the Cleveland community. So with Paul's replacement, that would be expected. And I think there are two or three alternates. I was surprised by how many alternates. But it's partly because if you're, you need to be able to go to the training, and after the training, you need to be able to hold confidentiality, and then you need to be able to be part of the interviews. And if you can't be part of the interviews, then we have to. So there are lots of alternates. So that being said, um, Principal leadership, stability is always something we want. And you're right that as people move up into places or over to places, that can create a domino effect. I have found that a lot of principals like that about Portland, that they actually have movement, that they can challenge and grow professionally. That's a challenge that we have as a district, just as an organization. I just want to share um, a story about two different processes that I've seen. Um, one was a process where but I would say the community was involved, and this is a real life, but I'm not sharing the school. Um, there were three parents involved at the time. There were uh, multiple staff members. There was district team um, involved. HR was involved, as they always are. Um, and when I talked to um, the folks that I knew on the committee, I said, how did it go? And they said, oh, really good candidates, but one head and shoulders above the rest. I so hope we can get this person. I'm not sure if we can, but I so hope we get this person. So it turned out we got, they got the person um, that they wanted, head and shoulders about the rest. Literally eight months later, the community was saying, oh my gosh, you have to get rid of this person. Now that falls again to the superintendent. So the community picked it, and I'm not saying that hiring is just a tricky thing. And then I've also heard folks where they felt similar to what I just heard you say that, um, boy, the community wasn't involved. You just put this person here. Eight months later, nine months later, people are like, this is the best thing. So the policy and the administrative directive does look to include parents. Um, that's not always possible, but there isn't something where anybody that gets to apply for Mr. Cook's position now just gets to be in there without community input. Right, that part I understand. Okay. Think the same thing from Oxford. Right. I just said when a good fit was found. The, the, that little committee you talked about didn't get engaged, okay. but there was always community input. I'm not denying that. Part. Okay. Yeah, that's great. But listen, you know, like you said, there's a there, there's a fit that needs to be made, and right. and you have to move forward. Right. Yeah. Okay. Are you asking about parent involvement and teacher involvement here at Cleveland? You, well, is that part of your question? Because it wasn't really part of your question. No, I, I'd like to speak to that sure. <laughs> yeah, if you want. The uh, there's. There's a couple things important in public schools that make a lot of difference on how we hire. Uh, one is who you know and who you are. Do you have friends? And we still do a lot of hiring around that, as far as I can make out. If you're, if you're in the right group, you can get a job in Portland and you get to move up. That happens a lot in Portland. It's happened for years and years and years. Uh, my ex-wife was a principal. My ex-father-in-law was a principal. And that happens a lot. And it shouldn't happen at, for principalships. What should happen is we should be involving the community and the staff. It's not a very hard thing to do. And I mean involving them directly where actually you should have, um, just putting this out, of, you know, coming right off the top of my head here. You could have a committee of parents elected by the PTSA in an evening meeting and they know that they're going to elect them, and those parents actually sit and interview the principal and make a recommendation on the candidates that are coming through. Then you could have a co another committee of, of teachers and staff and those people could be elected at a, at a teacher's meeting and they would then interview all the candidates and make a recommendation. There's nobody at the top in, in any business, in any schools, who really wants to give away that power. 
because that's their job is to hire those people. But the fact that we don't really directly include people in buildings, either staff or parents, and you can put a couple kids on each of those committees too and, and have them appointed by the student council, say. So you have some real community input where it's real input and they say, we like this person, this is who we like, one, two, three, four, and then we say, this is who we like, one, two, three, four, and if those match up and that matches up, you know you're in good shape and you feel like you had some input into the school and your community. That's not hard to do. For the life of me, I have no idea why we don't do that. It just seems like so simple. Way back, we were doing things like that way back in the 1980s and we're not doing it, and we should. The other thing is, I think we move the principals around way too much. If somebody's doing a good job, how long have you been here, Mr. Cook? 13 years. 13 years, he's done a good job, and people like him, and he's done a nice job, and so he stays here, he knows the building, he knows the teachers, he knows the parents, he really is able. We should think more in those terms than we do, and the other thing is, I think we're starting to do a better job of actually going out and saying, look, you can't be a jerk and treat the parents horribly if you're going to be a principal in Portland. That was the case a couple years ago. We've had way less of that this year. You've seen way less on, on Facebook blowing up about principals that people are upset. So we're starting to make some progress there, and I appreciate the fact that we're actually starting to make some progress there. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'll just say it's, all, it's always a tricky issue, um, getting community support and process is, is very important. Ultimately, superintendent has to make that decision because she's in charge. Um, I read the letter uh, from the PTA to, to the superintendent and the board in terms of a process, and that process makes sense to me. So, I mean, I think those are good ideas. Personally. They don't, my idea. they don't make sense to me. They don't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, and just as a final, I, I would Let's agree see. that as much community input as possible is uh, incredibly important. I would also say to you, for example, at Cleveland, that if we have an assistant principal at another high school, a principal at another high school, a principal at a middle school or an elementary school who is wanting this opportunity and wants to apply, um, you want to have the, the absolute best apply. At the same time, they don't necessarily want to compromise their position in their own community, and so it makes it a little bit awkward also to have too many people involved because word gets back to that community real quick that, oh, they didn't want, she doesn't want to stay here, he doesn't want to stay here. So, you know, there, there is a reason for some of the confidentiality, and so we try to have a, a balance there between as much community participation as possible, and we can always do that. Um, I'm, I'm glad that issue was brought up. Um, there's two gentlemen on the right here that said that, well, and you specifically said you read the letter from the PTA and you agree with their recommendations. And, and it, that's what you said as well, Steve. Um, but that's, that's not the process. The process does not allow for focused staff input as a, as a subset of those that are considered in the process of hiring the principal. Uh, there, there will be no, uh, from what I've heard so far, there will be no representation on the hiring committee from staff. Um, there will be no separate meeting with staff members alone to say, hey, what do you think is a good principal and the characteristics of a principal? Um, there, there will be a representation on the, on, the, on the hiring committee. And so the biggest concern that when you read the notes from Wednesday's meeting of last week was that parents from many walks of life, many professions, talked about the standard, the industry standard of those who will be managed have a significant voice in who will manage them in terms of, you know, what characteristics are, are a good leader for their site specific, uh, for site specific, like Cleveland. Staff have unique perspectives on students and parents and alumni and the Alumni Association and who we have here as a staff or as, as you know, as a community. And our, and, and it seems like that is not going to be considered in terms of who will be hired as a principal. Um, your, your, your process is a funneling of information from that one opportunity that we had the other night, an hour and a half, to have people write down notes and for you to send in survey emails and things like that. But that is pretty much the input that you'll be able to give to the district to 
fire the next principal at Cleveland High School. Um, so the, 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 question. My question is this. <laughs> the, the question is, if you say that you agree with this recommendation from the PTA, will you then supplement the process with representatives from these groups? Um, I, I will encourage that. It's ultimately up to uh, the superintendent to make those decisions, but absolutely, I will encourage that. I think it makes sense and seems to be pretty easy to do. I'll tell them I'll encourage it to do. Yeah. Director Beal also says yes. Okay. And do you, I was just curious if the other board members had an opinion on that. I, I think that I'm, I'll say no just as the short answer, um, not because I object to the, the process. I just, as I explained, I've seen many hiring processes with people coming on the other end really happy and really unhappy. So I don't think there's a magical process. I believe that staff often have ways of communicating, whether it's through their leadership and or in a public forum. Um, so I, I would trust that that would happen. Yes, I would encourage it. I think also, I mean, I reading through the notes from the meeting, I, and I get that it was just the one meeting, but the teacher's voice was really strong to me in that one around um, Paul's incredible strength as an instructional leader, that he really understood what it was like to be a teacher, that he was flexible, and, um, you know, I think those, again, are the messages that, that Carol is going to hear, both through that, through the survey, and through other means, not necessarily through a formal committee, um, and it's what we all want as well. So that's what I would say. I mean, I, I want to um, try to keep some consistency as best we can um, across our hiring processes for different schools. Next question. Go ahead and we'll go over here. Hi. Um, I've got two kids, one who will be starting kindergarten in the fall and one who will follow in a few more years. Um, and I'm just curious, there's been so much information flying around lately about boundary changes and uh, transfer policies and decisions being made and not being made and I'm just wondering if I can be put up to date as to where we are right now and what will happen in the next one, two, three years so that I can have some you know, knowledge and security about where my family will end up being at school and what their options are. Um, so I can start and try it and my colleagues can fill in. So. Most of you are aware that there was a recent vote on enrollment and transfer, um, which um, no longer um, opens up a lottery for neighborhood to neighborhood transfers. So if somebody wants to transfer from their neighborhood school to another neighborhood school, um, if they have reasons for that, they would go through what's called the hardship petition process, um, which has a criteria about whether or not that rises to the level of hardship that, that would be allowed. Focus option schools, um, so some immersion programs, arts programs, creative science, those kinds of things. Um, there's still a lottery, um, and then we, um, staff proposed one set of criteria and we changed them up a little bit. So there's um, sibling preference is still first, free and reduced lunch is second, um, and I'm not going to remember all of them. So people still have the choice to choose kind of alternative or focus option um, programs. Um, you mentioned the district-wide boundary, so we have um, started the first, to our knowledge, and I will admit that my knowledge doesn't go very deep, um, but to my knowledge, um, a district-wide boundary review, we used to do it by clusters, so some of you in this area might remember Llewellyn was over overcrowded, <laughs> and so we looked at Llewellyn and Dunaway and said, is there a way that we can fix this issue here locally and so we wound up and that was really cluster by cluster and what you found out in fact some of you probably remember even longer ago that southeast was in jeopardy of having more schools closed so they were going to close grout or maybe they were going to close Llewellyn um, and the schools got together and said hey how about if we divide this move the boundaries this way but what we realized right is that every boundary abuts another boundary and so when you move a boundary this way, you either take it from a, another school or you put it in another school. And so we've, under, we've started the process to under, undergo a, a district-wide boundary review. Um, and that, my understanding is a timeline just came out that decisions should be made or are being projected to be made um, for if we're going to move any K-8 boundaries um, next December or at the latest January so that you would have an idea before the next enrollment and transfer cycle happens where your kids are going to wind up and there will be community process um, as, there, as there was before um, with that. Now 
the idea is that we're working with PSU because we realize that boundaries, especially district-wide, as I said, have been in place for a long time, and some of them have a pretty awful history. So, for example, why does this boundary go from here to there? Well, it's because that area was redlined and only African Americans were allowed to live there and they were excluded from going to school here, for example. It's called redlining. So we want to get rid of some of those historic, if they make sense. We want to get rid of some of those boundaries and say, what does make sense for a boundary? And some of that's because of geography, some of that's busy streets, some of that's a whole bunch of different things. We want to take a system-wide look at it and try to find something that makes sense. Um, so that's the process we're going through and that's my understanding of the timeline right now. I have a follow-up question. Is there, because I'm not familiar with how things do fall out, is there ever a chance that my child would go to one school and then the district boundaries would be redrawn and they'd be then transferred by the school well, district? Yeah, so the question whether a boundary change would mean that your child have to move to current policy is that we grandfather, as it's called, current students. So To the highest level. To the highest level, <laughs> yeah. So no, that would not happen. But I think, you know, kind of taking a step back of sort of the reasons, for the, I see kind of two big reasons or two goals with this. One is that after years and years of declining enrollment and which led to super painful school closures and, and other things, that we're finally a growing school district, which is a good thing, but it's also creating a lot of problems, as many of you know, with overcrowding. Of course, we also have our aging buildings on top of that. So we're trying to try right size, as it were, in terms of our buildings as we grow in terms of students and in rebuilding and modernizing them over time, thanks to the support of the voters with our bond. But the other piece, too, is really we need, in my view, to be, we, the goal of this ultimately is to have a, a system of strong neighborhood schools where no matter where you live, you can feel good about sending your child to that school, right? And there's, for too long, there's been inequities. Um, some of it, there's a lot of different reasons for that and a lot of different issues at play. But one sort of very basic piece is just around numbers of kids, right? And what we had, one factor we had seen that the, um, the community group that brought these recommendations to us was seeing was that as the reputation of a school went downhill, <coughs> and the parents would transfer out, and then there would be fewer kids and fewer programs and, and so forth, so a vicious cycle. While this is just one tool, there's a lot of other pieces that the district needs to work on with the community. Um, we felt this was a really important piece for us to get our enrollment policy in line with our racial educational equity policy so that we um, have that in place to help us get to a place where, again, every single school, well, they're not going to be exactly the same. We don't want cookie cutters, but we have to be able to have, all parents should be able to know they can go to the neighborhood school and have a great education for their kids. So one last thing I would just say, the piece for us, too, I think is the transparency. Um, there's lots of data and information about what the fundings, what the funding is at each school, and the programs, but I think we can do a better job at that and sort of really um, have that um, highlighted and be more visible. <laughs> so to, where, to the extent there are differences, we can have an honest conversation about that and say, how do we address that? So two more things. You asked about the timing. Um, when we made the decision to go forward with a district-wide boundary, we also identified Tier 1 and Tier 2 schools. Those are schools that have really significant issues today and we almost feel like we need to do something sooner. Um, my understanding at this point is that we probably aren't looking at any boundary changes for next year, even in those schools. And so you're looking at Chapman with 700 and something kids. You're looking at Beverly Cleary on three campuses, West Selva with the split campuses. Those are some of the tier one and tier two schools. So we're trying to figure out some creative fixes next year for those that hopefully won't include boundary changes so that we can allow the district-wide boundary process to actually happen. And we'd be looking at implementation in uh, September of 2016. And then the one other piece to know is that I think during this process we're going to look at the whole K-8 middle school configurations and whether or not those are equitably placed around the district, whether they make sense given our facilities. So a lot of, I mean think of any, any private school in Portland as a K-8, so there's nothing wrong with the K-8 model. The problem we're having is oftentimes our K-8 schools are in small enough buildings that it's almost impossible to get enough 6th, 7th, and 8th graders to really allow for a robust um, enriched program. So we're probably going to be kind of revisiting that at some level. Um, and it may be that we end up still with a, a mix of K-8s and middle schools. It may be that we go back. It may be that we switch them all. Who knows where, where that will land. But that will be another thing to kind of pay attention to if you are caring about that particular issue. Uh, no, I, I was just going to say, I, I think this in our secret school board map, this lady's kids are in Gladstone. 
you're after next. So. <laughs> he, I think he was making a joke saying, in our secret school district map, your kids are going to be glad. So. Um, I, I do want to highlight, because you asked a little bit about next year and the next year and the next year. Um, and I just will call your attention to school board elections, um, that these are all policies. And you heard um, somebody say that our current policy is that we grandfather up. All of these po policies are subject to, to, to change depending on who's on the school board and what their, what their slant is. And so as the public trying to figure out what assurances they have, just know that we, um, if you hear somebody guarantee something, it's probably not true. So I just want to be explicit about that because we often hear somebody promised me. And I just want to be clear that that's not a promise. Yeah. Uh, hi. So first of all, I just want to thank uh, Bobby for um, taking the initiative to uh, go to the legislature and, and try and get that additional funding. I think um, out of all, I think that's um, probably 100 times more important than the right principal um, at a school because I, I, we're underfunded and we have been. Um, I also wanted to say that this is the first time actually I've been in any uh, Portland Public School meeting where I've heard anybody talk about middle school. And um, since um, I, I, I hear a lot of discussion about elementary school and a lot of discussion about high school, and my kid has spent, and I, I'm just going to be really honest, three miser miserable years at middle school, and we are so happy to be going, we'll be going to Cleveland. So we're, we're going to be so happy to be out of uh, Hosford. Um, and I, I guess one of the issues that I have is that I feel, number one, middle school is so often <coughs> overlooked. Oh, the three miserable years of social development, can't do anything with the kids. And as far as I can tell, that's a bunch of hooey. 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 Yeah. Um, it's some of the most important years. and. Um, I, I just, I, I just, am, I find it so, I find the, I found the last three years so tragic. It's very upsetting. <coughs> um, second, I would just say that I am a solidly middle class um, mom. I'm a single mom, but I'm solidly middle class, and my son is white. I feel incredibly underserved <laughs> by Portland Public Schools, and I would like to know how you're defining an underserved market. I understand that there are other, other families that have been underserved in this school district. But I think that ignoring families like mine is the wrong, <coughs> is the wrong way to go. I think you want families like mine to continue to stay in Portland Public Schools because I think we want to raise all boats and not just a few boats. And I, I'm just really, I'd like to have the definition for that. And then I have. Just one last question. Um, <clears throat> for, I don't know, the past at least five years, I've heard about this district emphasis on STEM and how the district wants to emphasize STEM and blah, blah, blah and how important it's going to be. And I never see an ounce of funding for STEM. And my kid, we, do, we don't do science fairs at Hosford. We, we did when the first year that my son was there because I literally went to the principal and I said, I will get you the money, I, will, I want you to do this because my son is very interested in science. And since then, we've never had a science fair. There's no, there's no <coughs> general science fair. Um, I mean, a lot of other schools and school districts do a global middle school science fair. There's none of that. The only way that my, science, my son has ever been able to do that is through our after school program. And this year, I didn't have the energy. And it's all, our after school program is all parent run. I didn't have the energy to set it up because we're doing Model United Nations. Um, and I, that, was, that was all I could handle. Um, but I, I just don't get it. It's not that hard. It's really not that hard. It doesn't take that much money. Why? Why? Hi. Can't we do something about STEM? All right, that's done. Sorry. I, I was a middle. I was a middle school teacher for the last 20 years of, uh, of my teaching career, and I taught uh, the first 23. Before that, I taught a lot of middle grades. I've been talking about middle school improvement since Honest Truth, 1975, I think, and. 
pretty consistent. But there's a lot of things we should be doing. I worked in a middle school in, in uh, Evergreen, which is fabulous. There are really good middle schools out there that we could be doing. It doesn't always cost you a lot to put electives in middle schools. We're teaching this instead of this. The, the testing is pushing us down in a lot of ways, and it has a lot of negative effects. Uh, and, and hopefully, we, I've been on the short end of voting here in the school board. No offense to my people I'm the short end of the voting with. And, but I'm going to continue to push. Hopefully, we'll get some people on the school board who really think those middle grades are critically important. And I'd, li I'd like to see that. A uh, perfect example is sixth grade outdoor school, where we don't even do We ought to be able to do that. There's a lot of things we should be able to do. And we're starting in the district to do some. Uh, Marshall Haskins, who's the athletic director, has gotten some money. And they actually had some middle school athletics tied to the school this year. And hopefully, we'll give them some more money so we can hire more and we'll begin to move in those directions. Because it is it's it is messy. And everybody, I, I agree with you, everybody thinks uh, K-5, high school. And they do get all the attention. But the middle school should be getting way more than it is. I, I, I agree with your points. And we, we do need to do more. And then we're planning on it. Um, and it's our, our, our kids went through the same issue the years did. So I understand. Um, so the idea about middle school, I mean, we literally just had this conversation at our, our retreat, um, which was last week, about how important it is to invest early, um, right, so early elementary, um, and how we've really worked to reinvest in our high school so everybody can have a full schedule, and being worried about that middle group that we're, that we're overlooking. And so we just literally had that conversation. I'm sorry you weren't there, um, but we are talking about it, um, even with people who we might not always agree on a vote. Um, the, the second about the STEM, um, that, that is something that's beginning to see investment from the state. And I just want to remind you that, um, and, and not you and not to this point, because we could be doing STEM instead of another elective, but it was just two, three years ago when we were looking at laying off hundreds of teachers. Um, we were in crisis mode, and so we cut things like sports, and we cut things um, that we knew were good for kids. Outdoor school went from five days to three days. Nobody did it because we're like, eh, that's not important. It was because we had to figure out how to keep a semblance of a core going. That being said, I think that you will see a reinvestment this year um, because we've already begun to talk about it. And I'm sorry to hear that your th last three years have been so, so frustrating to you. So I wanted to talk to you about feeling uh, white and underserved. Um, I think, as a general rule, pretty much every single parent in public in Portland public schools feels underserved at this point. And in part, that is because, you know, for you know, really since Measure Five, but certainly the uh, the first ten years I was on the board, we were in constant budget cutting mode. I mean, we have a, a absurd tax system in the state and we aren't prioritizing uh, education and uh, K-12 education. Um, but we do also know that we have some students who, uh, as underserved as we feel, are even more underserved um, and have more needs um, than a typical white uh, middle class student might have. And so we have special ed students, we have English language learners, um, we have a variety of high poverty um, students who really do need more supports. One of the things the board did many years ago was we set aside 5% of our general fund budget um, to try to better support um, low-income students. And in the last couple of years, we actually raised that to 8%. And we um, have 4% to kind of to low-income students and another 4% to what we call historically underserved students. Um, and just trying to get more resources to them because our outcomes are really disparate and terrible. So everyone in Portland Public School, I think, is feeling um, that they're underserved. And in fact, we have been. And it's one of the reasons that I'm going to DC on Saturday uh, to lobby at the federal level for um, you know, Title I funding for our poor kids, special ed funding. I mean, there's, there's so many areas where we're underfunded. 
um, and we are all working at the legislature um, in addition to that. We've been incredibly lucky at Portland Public Schools that we have a community that is so supportive and we have a local option now that literally pays for 600 teachers. Next year it'll pay for 650 teachers. So we're actually in a lot better shape than many districts around the country. But um, I think parents are exhausted. Um, every parent in this district is exhausted. And um, at the same time, I think if you can look ahead and look up, um, the economy is coming back. And I think the legislature has proven that it's willing to invest more. It invested a billion dollars more last year in K-12 education. Uh, we were able this year, with a little bit of additional funding, to add a couple of days to our school calendar to add another 200 or so teachers. So I think things are looking up, but really until we change the whole tax structure in the state, it's, it's never going to feel flush in my personal opinion. Um, I also wanted to just address uh, really quickly your middle school question. Um, with my children and with uh, all of their friends, I can tell you that they wax poetic about their K-5 years and they wax poetic about their high school years and the middle school nobody ever talks about. Um, and I do think that this board has been having a lot of conversations recently with the superintendent and through our budget priority uh, discussions where we're saying we want to invest more. You know, one of our priorities, of course, is third grade literacy, making sure that you can read by the end of third grade. One of our priorities is high school graduations. Um, but it's the middle school years that it just feels somehow as like the, the stepchild in the system. And so we're looking at how do we bring um, uh, middle school, after school sports um, forward. Um, could we be offering career technical education opportunities at the middle school level going up to the high school? Uh, should we be offering um, middle school band programs so that when kids get into high school, they already have a foundation um, of sorts? So I think that there is some focus and um, some discussion right now about how do we invest better in middle schools. One of our big problems, again, is in our 6-8s. A lot of times you have such a small grouping of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders that it makes it difficult to provide those services in an uh, economical way, which is part of the reason that we're having the discussion about middle school versus K-8. Um, but yeah, I think that we, I think you'll find a lot of agreement on this board that we want to be looking at hands-on experiential um, learning opportunities for our middle schools, whether that's outdoor school, Thomas talked about, could we give them a week of career technical education, I've mentioned the idea of could we do field trips to colleges, I mean there's, there's many, many things that we could be doing to make those middle school years much more robust. Um, it takes funding, um, but it also takes a little bit of vision and push, and that's what we need. Bobby's absolutely right. The funding and how we do the funding in the state of Oregon is, is really is really bad. And there's a new funding. There's a new push coming out. A man by uh, who was a state representative by the name of Unger, who's who's putting forth some new. Who, thank you. Who's putting forth some new ideas about what we should be doing this year in the legislature? But at the same time, we're spending a lot of money in one place that we should be spending in another place. And I'm pushing and pushing to try and get us to spend the money down in the schools, to buy teachers and to have things down in the schools instead of in some process stuff, where we get hit really badly by the testing and, the, and the, that whole idea and all the reform movement eats up a lot of our money, but we eat it up in a lot of other areas too that we could be doing much better than we are. And so I hope I hope you pay attention to that and as we go along in the budget process. This is a time to start paying attention to that. Also, I think all children's education is equally important. I've tried to get us to look at a foundation, so we have a foundational education for every kid that every kid gets. And then once we get that put in, then we move from there to to special needs for different children and. I can't get anybody to get on board with that, but maybe they will eventually. Can we go one and then two? Five. I have a question about our immersion program. Three. And um, Cle the Cleveland cluster is home to one of the Mandarin immersion programs in um, EPS. And last week you heard dual languages proposal of well, recommendations, and they can't expand the programs this year due to limited space and limited teachers. Um, and they said that our teaching pool is scarce, but they didn't really explain that the scarcity is due to teachers who don't hold the standard teaching license. 
and this eliminates a lot of candidates who are very, very qualified, especially those coming from foreign countries, which we look for native speakers for these programs. So I'm wondering how Portland Public can help support alternative pathways to licensures for our teachers. Can we look at portfolios or experience? And what can we do to support the hiring to help expand these programs that have proven to be very successful? It's a great question. So I don't know if you all heard it, but a question about um, licensure for especially dual language immersion um, teachers who may not have the traditional or state approved um, program but they come in highly qualified otherwise as teachers. They may have even completed their own teacher course in their native country. Um, so if folks don't mind, I'll jump in. Um, so one, we, as part of our legislative platform, because this is a state issue, it's the state that decides whether or not they're licensed or not, and we can't have students in front, or teachers in front of students for X many days un unless they have that license. So one of the things is that we support alternative licensure, and we'll be working with our legislature to find ways to, to help support that. Um, so that's one way. And the other way that I see us working is that we work with our local universities um, to figure out how do we get the right pipeline, but what is our need, and how do we, how do we attract the right students to make sure that, because they might be um, here already, um, they just need that right licensure. So those are two things right off the top of my head then. So how would you support the legislative? Well, it, it works by us talking with legislators to say it's important. Sometimes they're not aware of the issue even. Um, they have their own issues, right, because they would be legislating um, a department in their own organization um, and what would the rollout. So they typically have a, a vetting process, but we would be working and saying this is our priority and it's important. Um, and then we have somebody that works down in the legislature regularly. Um, he's our director of government relations that is constantly working down there and providing any resources that they might need if they have questions. Can I just add real quick? Um, so in addition to um, our us and our legislative agenda and our government relations person working down in Salem, it's super important, of course, as always, for you as constituents, as you know, to write to your legislator. So it's really, we can say all we want but when, you, when they hear from their constituents that this is an issue that matters to them, um, that's really important. And I just wanted to also call out that another area where we're really going to be struggling to find teachers is with career technical education, and we're trying to introduce more career technical education <coughs> opportunities all the time at our high school levels. So you can have someone who has been a, a plumber for 50 years, and uh, because they don't have a master's, in, a plumber for 30 years and wants to teach, um, because they don't have a master's in that, they're not qualified. So there's, there's a, again, that will be another area that we're looking at. You know, how do you bring that, that life uh, experience um, into our classrooms in a way that's, you know, respectful certainly of our union issues, but at the same time um, allows our kids to have the opportunity to be taught by folks who have really had that kind of life experience as well. So. Another thing we can do on, around the hiring process is to speed it way up. I've tried to get us to speed it way, way up, ahead of everybody else in the whole area, and to go out and do some different types of recruiting, but it's the same, it's the same story. It, we kind of blame it on the teachers, but it's, it's not the teachers. Teachers are ready to do, to allow us to hire as long as we place according to their schedule. We can hire in November for somebody the next year if we want, so we can pick off the best people around who are there in, in a lot of categories, not only language, also people of color, all, also STEM people. I mean, there's a, we can go out and get those people that, and, and make an inroad into it to add to what they said, which is very, the stuff you've done. That's really yeah, great. Hold on to it. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lynn Allers. I'm a teacher, ninth grade teacher here at Cleveland High School. Um, and I guess I'm going to go back to that transfer policy that's going on, the ending of moving, moving kids around. Um, because one of the things I am concerned about is building capacity where we have had schools closed. And Ruth, thank you for bringing that up. We have lost budget, so Bobby, thank you for bringing that up. But we don't have capacity yet at the middle school level. And we haven't addressed some of the issues at the middle school level. I see these freshmen coming in, and it's very clear where they're coming in from and the kinds of preparation that they've had or not have had. 
and that makes it very challenging for ninth grade teachers to get them to a place where they're all kind of equitable at that sophomore level, especially at a school here where we have an incredible IB program where we want all of our students to at least take one, if not more, IB classes. So my, my question is about the transfer policy. I'm totally fine with the idea behind it, but it feels very rushed. In this instance, maybe slowing down the process and building capacity and looking at what is what are some of the problems? There are schools that were created, um, you know, with uh, Vicki Phillips that became K-8 that have not still meshed and that are still struggling. Um, and these are schools that are coming into us and we're not at a place where we feel like we can bring them in because we, you know, are, we have a lot of things going on too for ninth grade. It's a huge transition. So my question is why is it happening so fast, so quickly, when we can't look at things a little bit more targeted and address these concerns? Now that we have budgets, so that we can look at STEM, so that we can build up these programs, um, you know, it's great that Hosford has parents that do after school programs. The school in my neighborhood does not have that kind of capacity because it's a high poverty school. So how do we talk about equity at a, you know, in a bigger conversation for that middle school year, which is a really important year? I, I, what we're trying to what we're trying to do on the school board, as I understand it, is to stabilize the school district, which might allow us to hand, to deal with some of those problems more carefully. That's what the boundary, the changing boundaries, and the Sackett report and everything is to stabilize the school district, so we can then actually work with it. And everything's kind of fluid now, and it's very difficult to. To deal with that, I, I wish we would deal with uh, K-8 to middle school, and I think as we do the boundary, I'm hoping that we will as we do the boundary changes. But I don't know. I don't know if we're going to or not. I have to ask these guys. I'm for it. So during our discussion about the boundary, which I think Director Buell was a part of, um, we said we wanted everything on the table because of how intertwined they are. So my understanding is that the K-8, as Director Atkins said, and middle school discussion is coming up. Um, to your point about equitable, and, and actually Director Buell pointed out about, wouldn't it be great if we had, here's the base, here's the base model of education and then we build up from there. We actually have that. We have, here's what you should expect in a K-8, here's what you should expect in a middle school, here are the number of kids that we need in order to provide it. And the challenge has been that as soon as that came out, as soon as that was implemented, as soon as that vision was put forth, we were reducing by tens of millions of dollars. And so all of a sudden we couldn't fulfill what were the original vision of what that hopes. So you just said, um, now that we have budgets, let's, let's start, right? So the foundation has been laid, I will say that. Um, and I just want to caution about that now that we have budgets, um, I've been in conversations with legislators, and um, right now the current proposed budget would mean a reduction to PPS schools. Um, so I, I don't want us thinking that now we're in a kind of a, a breathe out, kind of relax. There's still a lot of advocacy that we're going to need your help with to bring that. But let's assume that they do reinvest and they do um, bring it back up. Um, this is the conversation. As far as district boundaries, um, it, um, it's been at least a two-year process. We started with the enrollment and transfer, which has happened for 18 months till now, which has been intertwined with the district boundary. And so then we're going to go over the next. Um, and the PSU gave us three options. They said, you know, one, this is partly just a technical fix. You know where the kids are. You know what numbers you need to offer equitable programming. You could just redraw them and just say, here's what it is, because you know what it needs. They said, or two, you could do a couple of months of this, and you could do a couple of months of that, and then redraw them however you want. Or you could, three, actually engage the community in a real in-depth process. We chose option number three. Um, so we actually chose the slowest of the options that the professionals were recommending to us um, against some of that. Uh, I know I have at least one colleague here not tonight, here not, not here tonight, who um, felt like we were taking too long because these have been known issues and when I hear somebody say that it's been three hard years and their student is now out of middle school, there, there's some urgency to this, that we have to figure this out so that we don't wind up affecting another generation of kids in a way that we don't want to. I asked for the foundational level from the superintendent 
<coughs> and what I was sent is not even close to a foundational level of what we're talking about. So I just have to totally disagree. We need to have that. We don't have it, at least unless it's another <coughs> secret thing in the back room that you've seen that I haven't, because it's not, it just is not there. And it should be there, and I think it'd help us a lot when we, if we could do that. So I had one, and then I'm going to go two, and then I'm going to go three and four. I'll be very quick. First, thank you very much for being here this evening. I'm, my name, I'm sorry, my name is Vanessa Hughes. I'm a teacher here. I definitely did not check with my boss before doing this, but um, I went out on a limb. Okay, he's retired. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have an invitation for you. So I'm very happy to spend the evening with you. I'm actually a little su surprised there aren't more of my colleagues here, but I want one of the things that really works about this school in uh, Paul's leadership is transparency. So I'm inviting you into my classroom. I don't know when, I mean, I don't know when the last time you spent a day, my, here's my wish list, that you come and spend a week at Cleveland, and that's maybe unrealistic because of course you're incredibly busy, but at the very least I want you to come and spend a day in my classroom, and here's why. I think you'll get a student experience, you will, if you travel around uh, the day of a high school student, what does it feel like to be a high school student? You'll get a feel for the block schedule, the skinny Monday, actually that would be a great day to come, <laughs> skinny Monday, that's kind of crazy. Um, what are they exposed to? You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What are their, what are the classroom conditions look like? What are the class sizes? Are building conditions? Um, another reason is from the teacher's perspective. So you get to experience the day when the kids are in our classrooms, but also what happens when the kids are not in our classrooms and our prep and the email and calling parents and all the other kind of stuff. And I hope the biggest reason that I want to invite you in is because it's fun. You know, I love spending my day with teenagers. They're awesome. Um, but I think with the very busy and analytical and intellectual work that you do, kind of representing high schools, come and spend some time in one. And it's an open door policy. You don't have to tell me ahead of time. I'd be a little dodgy, but you know, it'd be nice to know if you come. But uh, <laughs> I, just any time. I teach down in room 129. I teach English literature I, in the IB programs. So that would also give you a perspective into that. I teach media studies, which is a ninth through 12th grade class open as an elective to all of the years. Just, yeah, come and have some fun, but I think it's really important given how the role that you do has to speak for so many situations that to be, to spend some time being a shadow in a high school. So there's my invitation. And I'm gonna email you again, my name's Vanessa. You get an email from me just to put a face in the name. I'll be persistent. Thank you. My 40 years of teaching experience counts. <laughs> this is 40 this years of. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Um, two was back here. Yeah, my, my girls are um, past the middle school stage. They're finishing up high school. But I really um, don't understand this whole middle school um, model. I grew up with sixth graders going with grade school. And I don't know the history of Portland Public School. But I was wondering if that's ever been looked at, re reorganizing that way where freshmen are actually part of middle school. I don't think that <coughs> sixth graders are well suited with seventh and eighth graders. And it's probably too broad to bring up here, but maybe I can talk to you guys an another time. But if that has even come up while all this K through eight is being reorganized, and if that's an option. I'll just jump in. I, I haven't heard about moving freshmen down into middle school or sixth graders back into elementary. Um, my understanding is that schools in Portland, many of them were built as K-8s, and then they went K-6, and then they went K-5. Oftentimes, that's, um, there, are, there are pedagogical reasons for doing it, but really one model hasn't been shown overly productive or better than another. There are trade-offs. So, for example, K-8, you wind up with some 8th graders behaving a little bit better sometimes than, than you do in middle school, but sometimes then there's a trade-off of electives that Director Regan was just pointing out. Um, I know that I went to, um, in my experience, my elementary was K-6, and then it went to K-5 before I got there because it was just, there were a number of kids, it was about facility. And so then the 6th through 8th went to a middle school, but then there weren't enough middle schoolers, so then they condensed it. In my second year of middle school, I went to 7th grade at my junior high, and then all of a sudden they moved the 8th grade up into the high school because there was room there. So 
I don't know pedagogically, and I haven't heard in our discussions, but I just say that I, I think that it's open. I know that I've heard Lincoln talk about being interested in a 612 model. Um, so some of those ideas are out there, but I haven't heard discussed uh, overtly. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Well, uh, also, my boss at the back, so I don't know if I can, but I, need, I guess something confused I need to ask. And, I'm a Chinese immersion teacher in Woodstock, and I start, uh, I start teaching since 1998. And at that time, in Portland School, Portland Public School it was the first Chinese immersion nationwide. At that time, nothing, even no single characters. So I tried to work so hard to build up, and at the first year we have kindergarten and first grade is a mixed class. 20 something students. After these 18 years, Woodstock expands so much. And this year I was told I'm not qualified because I don't have a uh, English teacher license. So my question is, I'm a Mandarin teacher. I, use, I got my education in China for these 18 years. I went to workshops, I went to national conference, gave presentations and and train my teachers and then get trained to other teachers nationwide and say, I'm not qualified because I don't have an English license. Now I was pushed to go to school to, uh, to take English classes so that I can teach Chinese uh, in Chinese. And, uh, but I'm a native Chinese speaker. It put me like a learning, like an English native speaker, go to school and then take those exams, read a lot. And I will put a lot of energy to learning instead of teaching my students. So I'm wondering, when we say put students first, I, I get confused. Now you want me to get those, though these years, many of my pay still keep low. I, I, I have I no complaint because I put my heart there. I don't care the case, that as long as my students achieved, I'm very happy. But I'm still confused, you know, and think I need to go back, go home, because I don't have a license. So I get confused about that. Why we have to treat it like an English teacher? Then my question is, if my English partner, so, so they have a Chinese, license so that they can teach English because right now I have to have an English license so that I can teach Chinese so I get confused about that that's why so many years I didn't go to school because I think I you know school is most important for me so uh, thank you for your question and thank you for for raising what what seems to be the absurdity of this the situation um, and I'd ask Art if you'd be willing to come talk with us to the legislature because it's that that personal um, story that shows how clearly not in tune the state is with their licensing about it. So I'm, I'm just sorry, and thank you. I mean, how can you say it's about students? So I think, I, I'm assuming and I'm guessing that our HR and our staff are aware of your situation, but just in case our board manager, Roseanne, is in the back, and maybe we can connect to make sure that we can um, stay, support, you. support you through our legislative, this legislative thank side of advocacy. Yeah, thank so thank you for being here. Thanks. Um, I'm a grandparent of two potential uh, students in North Portland, and I'd like to ask you to indulge me for a minute. I'd like you to look to your right and look to your left, and then imagine you're a third grader or a fourth grader. This spring, there is going to be a train wreck, and two of you are going to be told you are failures. It's called the Smarter Balance Assessment. And there's some nice paper out here that I suggest you look at. But the predictions are for that this test for the little kids is going to be a devastating experience. You, I'm here because I, have, I care most about the little kids. Your children that are at Cleveland already have made it through the existing absurdities of a public school system, and Portland is not unusual in that regard. These guys have a f terrific bunch of challenges, and they're doing their best to try and tackle them. But I want you to be aware that there is a train wreck coming, and it is not going to just be here, but your kids are going to be hit by it, and your friends' kids. 
and for you school board members, I'd like to ask you what you need to be able to say, to be able to do something to protect the littlest kids in this system from what is going to be an absolutely devastating experience. It is going to be terrible. And you are not, you are not powerless to help the parents of those kids and these parents to understand they have options, that they can opt out, they do not have to take these tests, they can submit information so that they can be excused, they can provide alternate activities. You guys are the 800-pound gorilla in Oregon. I don't care what the State Department is telling you how to say them. I don't, those guys are not going to pull your funding because of what this test is going to do. They simply aren't going to do it. So how can we help you protect the littlest children and some of these who are older? Thank you. So to catch, catch folks up, there's a new assessment we've been doing, the OAKS, uh, which is the Oregon Assessment Knowledge and Skills Test. Um, the state has uh, moved over to a new assessment called the Smarter Balanced Assessment. It often gets confused or transplanted with Common Core. Common Core is actually standards, but it's being measured by Smarter Balanced Assessment. So that's just to, to catch everybody up with um, what the gentleman was asking. The second piece is that our own state superintendent, Rob Saxton, predicts about 30 to 40 percent of students will pass this new assessment. Um, and so the worry, right, is that students will all of a sudden who were succeeding or feeling like they were succeeding will come away from this assessment feeling like a failure. Along with that, we had asked as a school board for the state not only to not attach teacher evaluations for this first year of the evaluation, because we don't know what the scores will be or what, what they even mean at this point, but we also asked them not to label schools as a result of these, and the state wrote us back and said, we don't care because every school is doing it. We're going to go ahead and label your school. So, um, so schools will be labeled according to the Smarter Balanced Assessment. Um, that being said, to your question about what, what do we need, um, I personally am not opposed to standardized testing, just in general. Um, so what I would ask is to take the high stakes piece off of it. What, what seems to me has gotten out of whack is that we've kind of put all the chips down on saying that if somebody doesn't do well on this one piece, then, um, then they're not doing their work or it's not succeeding. That seems skewed. I think the Smarter Balanced or the National, what is it, the NAEYP, -E which is a, a cross country, like it, it does give parents and students a little bit of information about how they're doing comparatively. Um, so I guess I'll just be quiet and say that that's what I would need is some support saying that the high stakes part of this is not, not appropriate. I gave a 45 minute speech in Eugene Two months ago on this topic, I could easily give you the 45-minute speech. I'm just going to make a couple suggestions. One, what we need to do is in Portland Public Schools is to figure out the negative aspects of this testing and try to mitigate it and try to offset it as much as we can. We're not doing that. We've taken a little stand here on the school board, which is pretty neat, and said, hey, we don't think it should be, you know, we, we're, it's too fast for us. But it's way, 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 way more than that. And if you go on the Oregon Save Our Schools website, which I'm one of the founding members, or the Oregon Save Our Schools Facebook page, you can find tons of articles and tons of things that will tell you what a mess this is, that we're taking our children in Portland, and we're pushing this upon them so somebody back in New Jersey can make a whole lot of money, and we're doing it. We're involved with it. i just leave you with one thing because, like I say, easily 45 minutes, just on this topic, easily. And, but one thing, if your teacher, if you sent your kid, just one, just one example of what, what takes place here, that you're not picking up on and I'm, nobody seems to be. If you, your kid came home from school, your daughter, say, fifth grade came home from school and said, and my teacher said that I, that I was stupid. You would be up at the school and asking the teacher, did they say I was stupid? 
And the answer, if the teacher said, yeah, I said she was stupid, I think she's stupid. You would be in the principal's office in three seconds. But at the end of this testing, which the kids care about as, almost as much as their teacher, the teacher is the number one thing, but we let testing become the number two thing for kids that they care about. And at the end of the test, it comes up and says, you failed. Sorry. And they go home as failures. And that's not the reason to, that alone is not the only reason to be upset with this test. I mean, if you'd like to talk to me afterwards, I'd be glad to stay. I'll give you 50 more reasons. I mean, they're out there and it's horrible what we're doing. But that's one to think about. How, how, how is that going to work for your kid, for your child in school, and for all of our children? Some who don't have any confidence anyhow. Now you're a failure. Good to know, isn't it? When I took standardized tests, they didn't tell me what they, how I did. That was fine. They could, why would they bother to tell me? Thank you. We have about five minutes left. Oh, okay. you oh sure, thanks. And I think, um, thanks, Greg, for your comments. And I, you know, when we uh, pat, unanimously passed the resolution expressing a number of concerns to the state um, last summer, um, laid out in quite great detail, as the director of Lyle said, we got back a letter saying thanks very much, but everything's pretty much everything's going to be fine. Um, so I do have uh, very grave concerns about the rollout, and I would agree with Greg. It's the high stakes piece. It's not, you know, when I when I when I hear that there's a oh that you know parents are afraid or they don't want or the school districts don't want high standards accountability. That's not it. But we do need to have the state. Um, if there, and no one is I think going to be sorry to see the end of the oaks. Don't get me wrong. I'd like to have something that's better than that. And this I think potentially could be. But I'm really concerned about the state's rollout and the high stakes piece of it. So that's why we asked them to have a transition or pilot status for this as they implemented it so that we could all, students, teachers, parents, everyone understand how does this work, what does this mean. And we really do, and I think what we, what we, part of what we made very, very explicit in that resolution is that we as a board and a district do not believe in teaching to the test. We believe in teaching the whole child and we do not want the culture of our schools to be based around um, high-stakes standardized testing. To the extent that may be happening in any schools, that needs that needs to end, and, and we're on the same page, all of us, about that. Um, but of course, it's a nationwide issue. So in terms of what can you all do, to, I appreciate the way you framed that in a positive way, what can you do to help us? Um, one piece, I guess, would be to share your, what your, your views with the state. Uh, it, to a certain extent, it feels to me like a juggernaut that is heading our direction, but you guys are the public and we have we've stated our piece and it helps us to have your backing and to know that you're speaking up as well. In terms of the opting out piece, state statute, I think it's uh, it's, it's medical yeah. or religious Yeah, but you, that reasons. religious is so very right. So do whatever you want. With right, so I guess, out. so what I'm saying is the state when, uh, there was a packed room at the Oregon School Boards Association um, convention on this topic because all of us around the state were con are concerned about this. And the state folks from the state uh, Oregon Department of Education were there, and, and uh, we asked about the opting out, and they just sort of said, "Well, the statute doesn't really address opting out, and it's kind of up to you to figure that out." So, um, I think that's one of the pieces we're going to have to pretty quickly here um, figure out. Just, I'll, I'll stop there. As, as Steve says, one can go on for quite some time on this topic, but I guess just know that philosophically. Where we're, where we're at as a district is wanting to make sure that we do have high standards. We want to be accountable that all our schools are providing that, but we don't want to have our, our schools and our teaching focused on testing. We want there to be joy in learning, so I'll close there. One other quick thing that I think we could use help with is just communication, um, because a lot of parents aren't even still aware that we're going to this new um, model. Um, and I think it's we're doing everything we can to try to get the word out and to set expectations appropriately. Um, but, um, I mean, our state superintendent basically is saying 30 to 40 percent of kids will pass this test. And if you look across the nation, uh, this isn't just an Oregon issue. If you look across the nation, uh, that's about the results that you're getting. So um, some of the communication piece would be helpful, too. So um, we have three more minutes, and I know at least some of us are able to stay a little bit longer, um, but I just want to respect if, if folks have to head out that, um, that we want I just want to, before you head out, thank you all for being here. Um, and again, some of us will maybe stick around even after we do this, but I'm going to take um, two more questions, and hopefully they'll be quick, and it's um, 
It's going to be one, two, and then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm a, a teacher from Woodstock, also a uh, Shenyang's colleague, and uh, uh, we know we are going to expand uh, Chinese immersion to Harrison Park, and also we already expanded our uh, program in um, King's School because of the um, license issue. So the um, postponed is, I mean, it's postponed for the extension. Uh, as I know, a Beaverton School has also a Chinese immersion called Hope. It's a child school. They don't hire a teacher have an initial license for the Chinese teachers. If the PSTC has the same standard, I just wondering why for Beaverton is one standard and for our Portland Public School is one standard. I, yeah, it's it's also Portland. It's a public school. Right. It's so a, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a great question to continue to raise. But charter schools are under different licensure agreements. And it's part of why some of our um, our teachers unions are actually opposed to charter schools is because they don't require them to have a professional degree um, in teaching. Yeah, our our um, previous uh, principal said our school is a public school but it has a program which is um, same as a charter school. <coughs> That's what we was told. So I just wondering if we can. So I we're happy to get you more information, but it, it's probably similar to that because it because the immersion program isn't a charter school; it's a district run school. We're under the requirements. We are under slightly different requirements. And then two. Uh, mine's a kindergarten question, so if you want to go, <laughs> feel free. Okay. Um, uh, thanks uh, for your job. I do not envy you, and for being here tonight. I'm Fawn. I have a first grader. Um, so um, about kindergarten, I, in talking with the teachers at our school and with my friends who are teachers, it seems like this is my impression. I'd love to hear yours that um, the curriculum is really similar to what used to be even just a few years ago in first and second grade. And that was really disappointing. Um, my kid did fine. She did great. By second semester, though, she was saying she didn't like school. And I thought I had till middle school till she was saying she was bored. Um, and I was really surprised to our great teacher, too. And I went and helped in the classroom um, with a writing project. And you know maybe a third of the kids could do it OK. A lot of kids struggled. And for some, it was just torture. This was a required project, and it just seemed like they weren't developmentally ready, a lot of them. Um, and I'm just wondering what the district is doing to, to address this issue, if anything. Um, if, and I've talked to other people, I don't think. I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding, so that's great. Maybe this is easier than the testing question, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Um, so my girls are three years apart in school, and what I saw my daughter experience in kindergarten was very different than what my next daughter experienced yeah. in kindergarten, and it's definitely dropped down. In fact, we have a video on our webpage about Common Core, yeah. and there's a seventh grade teacher that talks about what used to be taught in ninth grade has actually dropped down to seventh, so they are pushing it right because the idea is our kids are not where they need to be by the time they get to college, so they've pushed everything down. And Director Buell's been really good about advocating, saying, at some point, you, you get this mix match where it's just not developmentally appropriate for yeah. kindergartners. Like, it might, literally, my daughter came home and she was doing number math number sentences. Now, she could fill in the numbers, but she didn't get <laughs> what she was really doing. Um, and so that's the challenge. And so that's part of why, again, we asked the state to say, hey, let's, let's roll this out, but let's, let's be in conversation about what's appropriate for this. And they basically came back and said, no, we're doing it. Um, and that's part of the conversation about talking with the state. I do think that um, this is going to sound like if you're, um, I do think that some of these concepts can be taught at this young age. We just haven't, teachers are taking what has been used to teach that concept and just moving it down with them. And that's, that's not okay. That we need those kindergarten specialists to take what would be age appropriate and what they know developmentally for these things and to, to alter what would have been done for the, for the activity to teach the concept. And I think we're in that transition, but how many kids are we going to wind up having hate school between then? That's a very real challenge. And I just want to be clear that um, I've known lots of kids who actually in kindergarten didn't like kindergarten just because lots of reasons. So I, I don't want to say that that is reason enough, but it's something to very much pay attention to. Um, because kids are coming home with homework and they're really tired and they're like, I hate this. The origin of the kindergarten standards were put, put out by the P 
people who put together Common Core, and they, and they, and they didn't, they did not have anybody on their committees. A couple hundred people put the kindergarten standards in 45 states in America. They did not have one person who was a K3 educator involved in redoing the standards for millions of children in 45 states in America. That's what happened. And we, we have bought it as a district, in my opinion, instead of sitting down where we should say, wait a minute, let's look and see what makes sense. If you went out to David Douglas, I think they're doing that. I don't think we're really, we're pushing the common core as opposed to saying, what, a, what makes sense here for children and getting our best teachers together and sitting down and saying, okay, should we be doing this? We don't have to teach it exactly like they send it out of the state. We don't have to teach it exactly like that. We have a lot of flexibility, and we're not taking part in it, in my opinion. And I've been pushing and pushing, but same old story. Can't seem to get them to do it. So I do want to emphasize that one of the things we are trying, I do want to emphasize that one of the things that we um, know is that we do need to have a rigorous and relevant um, curriculum for our kids. and. While you have some kids who are, are bored and discontented because the work is too hard, you also have kids who are bored and discontented when the work is too easy. Um, and so it's a balance and, you know, it takes a really skilled um, instructor in the classroom to meet the needs of uh, different students. But, you know, in the end, you, we want to have a, a robust uh, education uh, for our kids and to try to keep up with what's happening in other countries. We need to figure out how to do that where it's developmentally appropriate, of course, as we go. So, we're, it's a, Common Core is a relatively new thing, and we're doing a whole lot of professional development around it. Um, and it's, it, it really is kind of a new, a newer, higher level way of teaching and learning um, that hopefully will pay off. So, we'll see. Last half question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the little card came. And it says that 11th graders must pass this test to graduate. So if only 30 to 40 percent are expected to pass, what happens to the 60 to 70 percent of 11th graders who can't pass this test? And does that not just encourage a higher dropout rate, which many public high schools in Portland have a problem with anyway? Yes, we and and this is coming this year, so So for those of you that couldn't hear, she said a postcard came in the mail. I'm not sure who it's from. <coughs> PPS. Okay, yeah. PPS said that the new standard is in order to graduate, 11th graders have to pass this Smarter Balanced Assessment. You just heard us say that the state's expecting 30 to 40 percent of people to pass this assessment. Doesn't this create an additional dropout? Doesn't this create additional anxiety? What's the plan? Um, I'll just briefly while I'm talking, say that um, we, PPS, has been strong advocates for alternative assessments. So last year you may have heard, um, or there was an article in the Oregonian that was actually um, framing this as, see, PPS isn't preparing their students enough because we had more students taking alternative assessments to qualify to, to graduate. Because there's been a test that students have had to pass, but it's been Oaks. And so we advocated for that to continue, and the state allowed us to continue for that. So that's so what we're doing for advocating. So can, I know that my daughter's in seventh grade. She's going to be taking this. I, I can tell you right now, she's not going to do well because she's not a good standardized test taker. There is currently an alternative. Okay. And, and does it have any repercussions if she can't pass these tests? Or is it just... There are no repercussions as far well, the state as state as long as you have a diploma, it is considered like every other diploma. Okay, and this because I think when she took the Oaks test, her teacher counted that as part of her math grade, which really tanked because she can't take the test. But this will not count as far as their grades go or I, I think grading procedure is um, related to teacher, like okay. a teacher sets the grading not policy. A, it's, it's not a, school it's not a district. district policy. Except and it, again, if, if the state, well, if the state says that you have earned, done what you need to to earn a diploma and we decide that, and they're still right now allowing for that exception, 
I, the reason I'm hesitating is I can't promise by the time she gets there yeah. that things won't change. Right. I'm um, sure currently that now, if if she were there and she didn't pass and she was able to perform on this other assessment, okay. she would be fine. No okay. repercussions. Okay. So, so I was yes, given the task you. from the folks in the back to <laughs> honor the time. I know I wasn't um, going to. <laughs> that, that, that comment or that concern was raised at Grant the other night. A lot of the current seniors already passed on Oaks. I mean, there, there will be some ramping up that will occur, and there are uh, uh, several different layers of, of, of ways to do it alternatively. Okay. Um, the other thing that was uh, we were reminded is that PPS has a survey out. They want to hear about your experience in your schools. Um, 2,500 respondents have already started, and the, the push hasn't really begun. But uh, discussions around 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, uh, high school concerns, those can all be uh, presented in the context of the survey. So, And uh, PTA will be part of the coalition that will be advocating on a lot of these issues, particularly on revenue. And the senator for this district, Senator Rosenbaum, is the number two Democrat in the legislature in the Senate. Um, both your legislators, if, if it's uh, Kenny Geyer and Rob Nose, are people that really want to hear from you, and it is, it is not a waste of time for you to do that, particularly you do it before they're in the midst of everything. We encourage that a lot. So. Yep. Oh, Just John. to take the, the oh, yeah. Successful Schools Climate Survey, you can go to the PBS website. It's right at the top thing on the website when you go there. And there's also paper surveys that are out here if you prefer a paper survey <coughs> rather than an online survey. I don't know how many clients have had tonight. Uh, Ruth is Thank taking you all. Thank, you Thank you all for you. being here. Thank you. Thank you.